so delighted to have each one of you here today. And welcome to the Salt Lake Chamber. I'm Derek Miller, the President and CEO of the Salt Lake Chamber in Downtown Alliance. Thank you for spending this time with us. Uh, we're going to learn together. We're going to have uh, a great discussion. And I, I want to make sure that you know how important it is to us at the Chamber that your voices, each one of you, are bringing your voice to this very important topic. Yesterday I had the opportunity to be in Washington, D.C. and uh, testify before a congressional committee on small business and what's happening in Utah um, in our thriving small business ecosystem. And, uh, you know, it's always nice to be able to go somewhere, especially somewhere like Washington, D.C., and brag about what's happening in Utah, and, and we do have a lot to brag about. Don't ever underestimate, by the way, the power of an inferiority complex, uh, but it is nice to, to brag about what is happening in Utah. And um, one of the things that we talked about, I was joined on the panel that was testifying before the committee, somebody from St. Louis, Missouri, uh, somebody from Loudoun County, Virginia, and somebody from New York City. And, in addition to talking about the good things that were happening in each of our locations, we were also asked by the members of, of the Congressional Committee about the challenges that we face. And uh, I have to tell you that I believe that the subject that we are here to gather, uh, gathered here today to talk about, is one of our greatest challenges. Not only uh, because it's a challenge in and of itself, but it's a challenge as a threat to our quality of life, as well as a threat to our continuing economic prosperity. And of course, that challenge that I'm talking about is housing affordability. Please note, you are all experts, so I'm sure I don't need to tell you this, but please note that housing affordability is not the same as affordable housing. Uh, those are two separate issues. And if you were here for the affordable housing meeting, uh, you're in the wrong room. But if you're here to talk, you know, talk about housing affordability, you're in the right place. And of course, that is why we are gathered here today. Um, Abby, in just a moment, is going to run through some of the facts and figures with you. And I certainly don't want to steal the thunder from the presentation that she's put together. But just as one data point, uh, did, were all of you aware that we are at a time in our state's history, uh, the first time in nearly 40 years, that we have more households than we have homes. So that's a challenge, that's a problem. And as I said, that's a threat to our quality of life as well as to our continuing economic prosperity. So let me just end my welcome uh, where I began, and that is how important your voice is to finding the uh, solution to the challenge that lies ahead. When I had the opportunity, again, to brag on Utah yesterday to the members of Congress, one of the things that I told them was that even success brings its own unique set of challenges. And that's what we're faced with. We're faced with a challenge that is a direct result of the success that we are having as a state. And the key to overcoming that challenge and what Utah does, I think, better than anywhere else, is pulling together as a community business leaders, elected officials, and other community leaders to overcome those challenges. So with that, let me hand the microphone to Abby, who's going to walk us through this morning's sequence of events. I'm actually going to get on this other. I'll give this to Brent. Well, thanks, Derek, and I appreciate everyone being here today. Um, we're streaming live, so if you want to join on and share, um, the chamber is streaming live over here, and then ULCT is in the back. Um, the, League of Cities and Town, so both on Facebook, and you can get this at any point after today's presentation. But Derek's exactly right. The reason we coined this as the Big Tent is we want to hear and we want to talk about this on a number of different perspectives. So today's agenda is really going to run through data points, the, the survey, or excuse me, the, the report that came out from the Kempsey Gardner Institute, which I hope all seen. If not, we'll give you a copy on your way out today. And next steps that we're going to go through as the coalition, um, Cameron Deal is going to come up and speak to you about um, what's happening on the local level and how they
they're participating in this. We're going to show you a little bit of bits and pieces of our phase one marketing plan. And I'll talk about this more in depth, but one of the biggest components to this issue is lack of awareness in the general public. And um, then we're going to spend about the last half hour hearing from you, where you see um, some focus needed to be had and, and where we can actually um, penetrate the message. So with that, let's just go through some of the facts and figures. Derek already mentioned this, but here's the actual numbers. And really, it, it is. For the first time in 40 years, there's the last 40, 40 years, we have more households than household units. And this will only compound as our population grows. So just, just keep that in mind. It's a really serious economic threat. You can see from this that really our household units are not keeping up with our population growth. Um, we need 250,000 additional household units to close this gap. And that's really the reason we call this coalition the Housing Gap Coalition, is to address the needs of, of the gap. So really, what's, what's happening and why are the reasons that this is happening? It's on a number of different levels. It's not one particular issue that's, that's really um, the focus of, of this issue. Is One is land. We're running out of land close to, in metro areas, close to jobs. The labor market is incredibly tight, and I'm going to show you some stats here in a little bit about the labor market. But we're seeing this on construction across the state that the labor market is not just a housing Current local policies have limited the number of housing projects brought to market. And this really means that the average Utah family is struggling with the gap between their housing needs and what they can afford. So we knew that this was a problem. We knew that there was an issue here because we, we, we were feeling it from the business community and the employees lack of, of being able to find homes. And so we embarked with the Kempsey Gardner Institute on about an eight month study that they conducted. Natalie never says this. Natalie Gochner never claims this, but she said that this is a landmark study. It's really unique. It's one of its kind in the nation. And um, she's, they're very proud of, of the stats and figures that, that came out of this. So on the right, you can see that the national average percent change since 1991 compared to Utah's. Can everyone see this? It's on a bunch of screens around you, but I don't know if you're getting a glitter from, from the sun back there. But we ranked fourth in the nation for housing prices. So based on that growth, the value of a home in Utah in 1991 was $125,000. That was the average price of a home in Utah in 1991. Since then, the average price of a home has increased to 347000 while the national average has only gone up to 184000 In other parts of the country, people and businesses are leaving communities like Seattle, the Bay Area, and Portland because of this issue. <clears throat> and really, in the past, the cost of living and our affordable home prices was really a competitive advantage for Utah. However, Utah's home prices are 20% higher than cities like Boise, Las Vegas, Phoenix, and really these are some of our top competitors in the job market right now. Snapshot of the sale prices of a single family home, and you can see in Salt Lake and the Provo Orem areas, we're both in the top 12 of 111 metro areas. The Provo area um, increased 278%, while the Salt Lake area increased 304%. So part of the growth and prosperity in the state is due to the fact that people in Utah want to be here. You all want to live here. We want to live and work here in Utah. And we want our families to stay here in Utah. And really, people are getting priced out. Right now, one in five, or excuse me, one in eight Utah families spend more than 50% on their household, on their 
home purchases and, and income. And really, the trajectory is showing us that one in five will spend more than 50% of their income on housing here very soon. A teacher, first year teacher in the Nebo School District, that's in Utah County, can afford 1% of the homes that are available in Utah County right now. After 10 years working, they can afford 16%. That's an issue. The people that we need in our communities, teachers, firemen, police officers, nurses, cannot afford to live in our communities anymore. So really, what's driving up costs? We have a housing shortage. We know that construction and labor costs are on the rise. We have local zoning ordinances, and I'm gonna, I'm, who knows what NIMBYism is? Just throw it out there. Not in my backyard. We feel that in so many different communities. Land costs and really where we live as far as the mountains and the, and the lakes, our demographic and our economic growth. So we're gonna break down all five of these areas to give you more context and information. So first, the housing, housing shortage. Since 2010, there's been four households combined every three household units. That's across all the markets. Existing homes, new constructions, rentals and apartments. Here's the cumulative days on the market, uh, broken down by counties across the Wasatch Front. The average day a home sits on the market is less than 15 days. We spoke to a bunch of realtors in Utah County last week the average is four days now in Utah County. So you know if your kids or grandkids or you yourselves are trying to find a home right now, it's very competitive. In 2017, a finished new home was only vacant for less than a month before it was sold. You can see that's at the lowest that we've had. Looking across the Wasatch Front as far as rentals, comparing 2005 to 2017, the number of apartment vacancies have decreased significantly, even though the number of apartments built has doubled. These three housing markets, existing homes, new homes, rentals, really are just not able to keep up with the demand. And the shortage, this is just economics, <coughs> supply and demand don't have enough supply in them to market and the demand is so high it's increasing costs. Construction and labor costs, another component. We compared 2007 construction jobs to 2016. Construction of buildings, heavy, heavy and civil engineering construction and specialty trades. You can see that there's a negative percent difference across all the board. And really this is this is due to the fact that we just don't have enough people that are interested in this market anymore, working in this market anymore. And it's an issue. And we're, we're this is one that we're working on. If you are familiar with the Keys to Success program or the Code to Success program that the Garf family put on, there's going to be a construction and labor to success program it's called Build to Success. So hopefully we can get more of the younger generation interested and involved in this. Right now, the average journeyman plumber can make six figures. $146,000 is the latest figure we saw for a journeyman plumber. These are, these are careers and jobs that people really don't understand. Um, and we, we want to make sure that they're aware of it. We're building a lot in Utah right now. We have the largest construction project going on in the nation at the airport. It's got about 4,500 employees out there in the construction industry that are working out there. And not all of them are from Utah. They had to, they had to go to Arizona to, to get a lot of their workers to come in and work at the airport. Huge part of this component too is immigration. 
and wrapping our hand, hand, arms around that issue. And obviously, we can't control that here on the state level, but we can continue to advocate for it at the national and federal level. Our hard construction costs are on the rise. So I won't go through each one of these, but you can see the percent change um, from 2017 or 2007 to 2017, or the, and those are all increases. Our permit and impact fees have increased 26 percent since 2017, and really this is reflective to CPI, but just a component that we need to be aware of. Getting into the local zoning ordinances and the NIMBYism. Really, zoning ordinances determine density. They just, just determine the distribution of housing types, rental, rentals versus ownership. They determine the construction material standards, as well as a number of regulatory requirements that increase housing prices and cause delays and they're different from community to community to community. And so there needs to be a balance of housing types to make sure that people are, are continually priced out. And we're working with cities to make them aware of this, to see if we can come to some common solution and make sure that some of these, um, some of these issues are closed. And then we all know about NIMBYism, and we're feeling it everywhere we go that people just don't want density in their backyard. They don't want certain housing types in their backyard. And a component of what we want to do is raise the general, general awareness uh, to local communities to make sure that they're aware of this problem. Our land costs are on the rise, and really the best land has not been saved for last. There's a limited number of developable lands across the Wasatch Front and really um, not the best land. Harder to develop, material car costs are increased, and really a raw piece of land now has increased by 40% in the last decade. These numbers do not show the price of the land, just the increase. Um, it costs about $52,000 now to develop a piece of land, where in 2007 it was 37. And obviously we all know that we, we can only grow so far and because of the lakes, because of the mountains, we are constricted. Derek mentioned this, but really we're having a tremendous amount of economic success. You can see that in 2010, Utah has ranked first among all states in demographic and economic growth. Job growth, we lead the nation in employment growth. And over a six year period, the number of jobs in Utah increased by 21%, far ahead of 16.9% in the second two markets of Colorado and Florida. So the report showed that by 2044, if we continue on this trajectory, that housing prices will be equivalent to the San Francisco market. Just think about that for a minute. And this is the conservative number that was in the report. There was a higher number as well. The median sales of a home will be more than $700,000. Today it's 347000 2007, it was, excuse me, 1991, it was 185,000. So what now? We commissioned the study. We got the results back. We've talked to a lot of people and we said, we've got to start raising the awareness on this and we've got to start making some changes. That's why you're here today. The Housing Gap Coalition, Coalition was launched in May immediately following the, the release of the report. And really, we want to continue to make sure that every Utah can fulfill the American dream of owning a home.
and investing in their future and their future retirement. And really, we've got to provide a variety of choices for people. Not everyone wants to live in a single family home or can afford to live in a single family home with, on a Puerto Rican lot. Not everyone wants to live in an apartment and not everyone wants to live in a condo. But we need to have communities that reflect the balance of housing types for the people that are coming and that are growing up here in Utah. And really, as the business community, we've had great success in working together with the locals, working together with the advocates, and we want to continue to do that on this topic. There is such a correlation between infrastructure and housing, and we cannot work independent of one another. There has to be a direct tie in everything that we do and every decision that we make as far as infrastructure and housing is concerned. So we want to bring together really the brightest minds from business, academia, government, and the advocates to start to tackle this issue. Today is really the first endeavor of that. There are some aspects of the issue that we can't easily change. We can't move the mountains. We can't drain the lakes. We'll be maybe good, but we, that's not an issue we're going, we're going to tackle. Um, but there's a few things that we can talk about and we can work on together. We can encourage local governments to think long-term about their communities, to think about the future, the population that has already been projected for their communities, um, and think about zoning laws and adopting zoning for all housing types, looking at their impact fees and evaluating those that many communities have already done that, supporting multi-use land development, Possible solutions, we have a great opportunity here with the CDGB, that is a tongue twister, the Community Development Block Grants that the Wasatch Front Regional Council, um, you, communities can go apply for this and they walk them through the steps of zoning. And they walk them through the steps of actually getting to the point where they can build their communities for transportation and housing. I already talked about this with the Keys to Build, the, the Build to Success program that will embark later this year. General public awareness. We really, it was pretty evident in the Olympia Hills situation that the general public doesn't understand the levity of this issue. And we have to make sure we get that message out. We can all do that together. So really what's next is starting next week. Um, we are gonna visit every city council across the Wasatch Front between now and the end of the year to get this message out. We're gonna embark on a um, multi-faceted media campaign that will start on July 1st. We're working with the league to have a two-way conversation on where we can find changes together because this isn't a one-size-fits-all solution for every community. We want every community to be uniquely, be unique in their own way, but have policies that address our population growth. Wendy is gonna walk you through some of the aspects of the media campaign here in a minute, so I won't get into this, but this is some of the concepts that we're working on. And you'll see multi-levels multi over the course of the next year of, of awareness. And really today we want to have a dialogue with you. But we've got to get our message out. So we want you to follow us on Twitter. We want you to follow us on our on our webpage. Contact Brain, make sure she's got your contact and I think you're all filling out the, the form um, today because we want to make sure you're aware of this. Um, but we're not starting from ground zero. Envision Utah did this so many years ago and said we've got a plan for the future and they did an amazing job out of daybreak and we're not starting from zero. We have a good foundation and as Derek said, we do really well when we all come to the table and we work together. And so if we can find solutions that best fit each individual local communities while not just turning our back on the fact that growth is coming, it's here and we've got to prepare for it, 
and really preparing for growth and preparing for the future will sustain our quality of life. So with that, I'm gonna invite Wendy to come up and give you an overview of, um, of the marketing campaign that will launch in July. And then Cameron Deal is gonna come up and give us an aspect, a perspective from the local communities. I'm gonna change the slide deck. Can you hear me in the back now? Okay, thanks. Um, I'm Wendy Hansen, I'm with Penna Powers, and we're a communications agency, and we're working with the Chamber on this effort. And um, before we jump into the concepts that we're going, to, that we're working on, um, I just want to tell you a little bit of background that um, we've already heard public dialogue. Um, Abby mentioned the Olympia Hills, but this is, there's been dialogue about these issues for years, and you're all very well aware of that but um, that dialogue is not necessarily representative of everybody who is affected by this issue. That dialogue isn't necessarily always super informed about all the facts, like the kind of facts that we see in the Gardner Institute report. And, um, and there's, there's maybe a little fallible logic that maybe, maybe real understanding of a problem isn't well known. And so our purpose is to help elevate the dialogue, get a little better public awareness out there, and help people understand the issue better so that they can make better informed decisions. The, the better public dialogue means that we'll have better solutions for the housing gap, right? So um, our overall plan, we have three main audiences. One, are, Abby already talked about those policy makers, those decision makers <coughs> that are in cities and counties and across the state. Um, making sure that they have good information and compelling information for those local policy decisions. Um, and we'll be reaching them through the meetings she talked about, through PR, through outreach. And then our second audience who we really want to engage at this point and start with in our phase one are what we call YIMBYs. So Abby talked about NIMBYs. Our YIMBYs are the yes in my backyard. And we think that they're a younger group. We think that they're a group that are more interested in various housing types. We think that they are the most affected by this because they're trying to find places to rent or um, find a home to grow their family or that kind of thing. And so we think this audience is not as engaged and not as represented as they could be. So it's where we want to start and we want to give them really good information. And then um, later on in phase two, we're going to go after the NIMBYs and the rest of the audience and, and have some really compelling information for them as well. So this phase two, starting in the summer, going into the fall, following the schedule of city council meetings, we're going to be reaching out to this younger audience of potential YIMBYs and educating them. And what we're going to do is mostly digital media because that's where they are. They're on their phones. They're on the internet a lot. And so um, our thought, we're going to do a really, um, it's a very mobile kind of driven campaign. And we're going to, we call it tiny houses. And the idea is that we have a very compelling visual, a very compelling little video that catches their attention. And then they look at it and then over on the right you see like it's a Facebook post for example there'll be like a really hard-hitting fact like this one is talking about this couple they're all crowded in their little tiny house and, and the analogy being that the housing market is getting really crowded the renting market is getting really crowded and then we hit them with the fact like the 2.6 um, all-time low of um, occupancy rate or yeah occupancy rate in the Salt Lake market. So we have a couple of examples like that. We're going to be producing those over the next couple of weeks. Here's a guy in his home office, housing's looking cramped, talk to your city council. That's the other thing we wanted to do with them is not only to build awareness with them, but encourage them to get involved at a local level and speak up because maybe they're that silent um, majority or that silent balance of, of stakeholders that need to speak up and, and say, well, what's happening in my community and, and what can I do about it? Um, this is an example of a realtor and she's trying to have an open house and it just gets overrun by lots and lots of people and again we hit them with a the hard fact more utans than housing units or households than housing units so we should have that ready to run um, I think the very first council meetings we're going to are on July 10th and we should be up and running that week and in the meantime or between now and then we'll be getting all the rest of social channels activated in the meantime, follow us on Twitter. Do you want to talk about? 
Oh, yes, and we're and the other piece that we want to work on is earned media that will be actively out pitching stories, talking about um, what it's like for the firefighter or the nurse or the um, whoever that that moderate income person that needs to live close to where they work, um, and coming up with with relevant stories to to keep the story going, to keep the dialogue going out in the public about these issues and educating the public with them. I'm Cameron Deal. I'm the executive director of the Utah League of Cities and Towns. And first, I applaud the chamber for starting this initiative and bringing together stakeholders around the state to have this conversation. The league represents 247 cities and towns, but what does that mean when I say we represent cities and towns? It means we represent the mayors and the council members who are elected by their residents to preserve the quality of life in their communities. Every two years when there's a municipal election, we hold newly elected trainings around the state. And we actually asked those mayors and council members, why did you run for office? And almost, almost exclusively, the answers come back to, I want to make a difference in my community. What we've also found over the last few years is more and more concerns about population growth. Like, I want to make sure that we can preserve our quality of life while also recognizing that our community is growing. To that, I say to all of us here, congratulations. Uh, Utah has been discovered. Utah is in demand. Utah has bigger families than anywhere in the country. Uh, we, we have some wonderful things here in Utah that, that make Utah special, but we're not going back to the 1960s. Nostalgia is not a policy. Uh, we're not going back. We need to look forward. And local government leaders are on the front lines of those conversations. So they see both the benefits and the consequences of population growth. Population growth brings economic prosperity, but it also brings additional costs on roads, on transit, on sidewalks, on water, on sewer, on schools, and recreational access, and, and everything that contributes to that quality of life. Local government leaders are on the front line. What do I mean when I say they're on the front line? Well, local government is the most accessible government, which means that when residents are concerned about what's happening in their neighborhood, or they're concerned about what's happening in their general community, they call their council member, or they call their mayor, and they have those conversations. That's why it's, it's important that all these stakeholders together, and it's important that, the, that local government is in the room, and for that I applaud the chamber, Derek and Abby, and, and Brent, and everyone else here at the chamber, for making sure that local government is part of this conversation. Derek made a comment earlier about this is, that this conversation is about afford housing affordability rather than affordable housing, and, and terms matter. One project that we're working on at the League that we hope to unveil by the end of the month is a, is a document that will be keys to housing to help local government leaders understand what it is that they do, the keys that they have to unlock housing, but also recognize what keys we don't have. And when, when Derek referenced the fact that this conversation is not about affordable housing, I want to push back on that to a certain degree because ultimately uh, true low-income affordable housing does need to be part of this overall conversation because by and large true low-income affordable housing is a, is a market failure. The market doesn't produce that on its own. So there has to be a conversation there about that true low-income affordable housing. What also needs to be part of this conversation is that housing alone in a vacuum, creating more housing doesn't actually address that overall quality of life and affordability. So we need to talk about housing in the context of transportation planning and access to opportunity like jobs and schools. And in fact, the League and many partners in this room supported SB 136 this past legislative session, which for the first time is really going to try to tie the investment of state transportation dollars with what's happening on the ground with local land use and local economic development potential. So that is that is the first step, and we've referred to that bill as a game changer, because that's the first step of trying to bring all these pieces together and to, to have this big picture perspective. What we're trying to communicate to our membership is that while you are acting locally, you need to think regionally. And you need to think about the overall region and what we're going to look like 10, 10 and 20 years from now. Uh, that's why we, we appreciate the study that, that you saw here today. 
And we think it'd be interesting to dive deeper into some of the data that we talked about today. For example, we saw there's a surplus of housing for 40 years. There's not a surplus these last seven years. There's a shortfall. And it'd be interesting to, to really dive into those numbers deeper, see the impact of the recession during the first few years, about seven years. What is What are the projections of new housing over these next few years? And where is that housing going to be? Because it, it's important to recognize that all, all cities are different. Uh, and Abby, I appreciate you saying this, but, that this initiative is not a one-size-fits-all approach. It's a recognition that Salt Lake City is different than West Valley, even though they are adjoining cities. And certainly these two cities are different than Midville, and different than American Fork, and different than Logan, and different than Manti. And every city is dealing with population growth in its own way and, and needs to think regionally, but the, the challenges are acute. And let's let's talk about let's talk about high density housing in the context of right here in downtown Salt Lake City. We're surrounded, if you look just through the windows here, you can't see here, but there's high density housing surrounding us right here, and it makes a lot of sense. You have access to transportation, you have access to jobs, there's the university right up the tracks line. So it makes a lot of sense to have high density in this area because you have this nexus with transportation, you have the nexus with access to opportunity. Part of the reason you saw pushback from residents out in the area surrounding Olympia Hills was because of population growth in general, that you already have roads that are taxed, you already have schools that are overburdened, and to drop one additional resident there, regardless if it's in an identity unit or a house, would just add to that burden. So it, the conversation, I think, now is going to a good place where we say, okay, what does the future of the region look like? How do these developments fit into the overall transportation puzzle and the overall puzzle of access to opportunity? And let's make sure we're we're having that conversation. I mentioned that there are keys that local government holds, and Abby mentioned some of them. Uh, there are regulatory pieces that local governments are responsible for. And those regulatory components are important. Uh, impact fees help pay for infrastructure and public services that those new residents will use. We do think it's a fair conversation to talk about the impact of that regulatory burden on the cost of housing not just in the impact fees context, but in the entire context of local government regulation. So we're willing to have that conversation. On the zoning side, again, recognizing that zoning is how communities build and, and have that character. And so we're willing to have that conversation because that's, you know, that's, that's the crux of local government, is what do our communities look like. So yes, we're, we're willing to, to have that conversation. With the acknowledgement that everyone out in the general public cares about their hometown. And they're looking to their local government leaders to preserve that hometown. And so it's critical that it's, that it's not just a two-way conversation, that it's a multi-way conversation. Uh, for example, I, I applaud the efforts of the private sector and Holiday to go out and, and reach out to residents and talk to residents about the vision uh, that they have for the Commonwealth Development. I, I applaud that step. Uh, you know, We'll see what happens in the, in the next steps going forward. but. I applaud the outreach because it's that sort of multi-stakeholder conversation that will help the overall awareness in the general public. So there's there's a role here for the private sector. There's a role for the public sector, local governments. There's a role for the state, particularly on, on financing, uh, especially when we talk about true low-income affordable housing. There's a role for banks. There's a role for our transportation partners, MPOs, to help look at that, that regional perspective as then would be drilled down to make local decisions. And then there's a role for the general public. I'll go back to the general public in one second. The other thing that we've committed to do as local government, and we worked hand in hand with the Salt Lake Chamber during the legislative session on this, as well as with the Department of Workforce Services, is with a bill that passed that was House Bill 259, the Modern Income Housing Requirements. Every city going forward of a certain size is required to have a moderate income housing component as part of their general plan, and they have to update it every five years. That is also a game changer, because now every city council is going to need to be reviewing their general plan on this regular basis, and even though part of this requirement existed for the last 15 to 20 years or so, the new requirements in the law are more specific and require greater responsiveness by local government. So you're reviewing these plans every five years, and you're submitting reports every couple of years with actual data points that'll help cities make decisions about the housing stock within their communities. 
So we think that's a very important bill. We supported the bill, and we've been partnering with the Department of Workforce Services to get information out of the city so they can start complying right away with that bill. Because we think good information leads to good decision making. And we think House Bill 259 is an important step to making sure we have good information. The League is also working closely with our transportation partners at, M at the MPL level to make sure that there's good information from Mountain Land Association of Governments or Wasatch Central Regional Council getting back to local leaders. So again, as they're making decisions in their general plans about transportation, about zoning, about housing, and the, the other decisions they're making on those really micro, micro local levels, that they are having that regional perspective. So we applaud the work that's been done, we applaud the work that's down in Envision Utah to set that big that vision and the work that the Chamber's doing. Well, I mentioned the general public, and this is where I want to close, because I started by saying that the local government leaders are the most responsive. And I know there are some that are frustrated by that, that local government is the, the most responsive to the will of the people. And that, that elections can change the course of government policy. Certainly we see that on the national level. Uh, you look at where, what federal policy was in a variety of levels in 2016 versus what it is today in 2018, it's nine day different. Those are the consequences of elections. What this group ultimately needs to determine is what are the values of our neighbors? What does it mean to be a Utah? And does population growth threaten the values of Utahs? For many residents, the concept of population growth is actually a four-letter word. And it's not just density. De density is often the target, but it's, it's really just that bigger concept that the world is changing underneath them. And sometimes there's a cognitive dissonance with it, right? The growth is internal. Utah's largest family sizes in the country. I'm contributing to that. I have a four and a half month old. Uh, so there's a cognitive dissonance to the fact that you may have six kids, but you don't want anybody to move into your city. Well, why does that happen? And what are the values that we can collectively contact and communicate with so that those residents understand that population growth is, is happening, that, there's, that there are limited levers with which to stop that? And what can we do now that will preserve and maintain and promote the quality of life that we've enjoyed for generations? Part of that is the pioneer ancestry here. Part of that is what it means to be an individualist. I want to be able to drive my car anywhere. In fact, I'll, I grew up in Murray, right in the middle of the valley. And I bit, and I fondly remember my, my late mother always saying we could get anywhere in 20 minutes. It drove my dad crazy. But in her mindset is that we lived in Murray and we could get anywhere in the valley when I was a kid in 20 minutes. And I can't tell you how many things we were late for because of that mindset. <laughs> I walked in late to a piano recital and half an hour late because she thought we could get there in 20 minutes. My dad knew we couldn't. But that mindset is, this is what we've always been able to do. I've always been able to get in my car and go places. I don't want to have to take a bus. I don't, I, I don't want these things. And yet, when you talk to them in a different way, do you want good air quality? And do you want to be able to access parks and recreation? And do you, do you want your kids to live nearby? Do you want to be able to downsize your house but stay in, this, in the same city and, and have other types of housing? They say yes to those things, right, Robert? You got, that was what you found in, in, in your Utah, your future. So until we are able to figure out how to communicate to the values of those residents, it almost doesn't matter who the elected officials are. It doesn't matter who's making the decisions. Until we can channel these messages in a way that doesn't anger residents, but in a way that helps them catch the vision, then to me, that's the old, that is the ultimate objective for all of this. And so, uh, with that, Abby, thank you for the, for the opportunity to present. And again, the reason the league is in the room today, and we have several city leaders here across the state, and that's why we're streaming this, is to make sure our membership across the state sees it, is we're here to be partners in addressing housing affordability and addressing population growth in general. Well, that was great. Thank you, Cameron, and I, I think we're coming to the, from this at the same perspective, and I couldn't have said it any, hopefully, some, well, I know it's on video, but hopefully someone captured that very end piece, but um, what we're going to do now for the next little bit is just hear from you. So we've got a microphone that we'll pass around, so just raise your hand. Um, we're taking diligent notes and um, just see what you have to say here. 
Representative Joel Briscoe, Utah House of Representatives. Um, we've had a, we set aside a fair amount of time in economic development yesterday in the interim. Uh, we got bumped because there were a couple of items ahead of us, one of them an audit of the road home. It took a little bit more time than was allotted. There's a county on the Wasatch Front that has a, not quite as large as Salt Lake. And some of the representatives say, okay, there's a problem, let the market take care of it. So how do we respond to that? I think that's fair, Representative. I'm, uh, that's, that's a good We don't, we don't like government programs, mm -hmm. right? We are an entrepreneurial people. We, we, we like solving problems. On some issues, we are willing to work very closely together. But the free market is going to fix this, and we don't need any government intervention. So how do we message, how do we have a dialogue around that? Well, and I think that a huge component of this is, is working with, in the free market and not looking for government solutions here. And it's and it's us raising the awareness to Cameron's last point of, um, you know, we've got to change the policy at, uh, on the local level, but we also have to work together in the private sector to address these needs. And, and you know, if anyone wants to add anything to that, Clark, if you want to add anything from the private sector, um, I'm certainly not making these decisions, but. I'll just uh, speak for the private sector. Um, you know, Cam mentioned what we're going through at the Cottonwood Mall. This is an interesting case study. Um, I'm Clark Ivory with Ivory Homes. And um, what, what we're seeing right now is that uh, we've been through a long process with the Planning Commission and City Council. And we've had you know, while there might have only been a few public hearings surrounding the Olympia um, decision, there were 21 public hearings that we went through for the Cottonwood Mall redevelopment. And we listened and made a lot of changes, significant changes to our plan that, made, that challenged the economics of the plan. And we incorporated ideas that we had never thought about before, uh, 1.2 mile walking trail around the perimeter of our community. Um, we put in additional open space. We reduced the density. We changed the lot sizes in areas that were most proximate to the existing neighborhood. We did a lot of different things. And, um, and over a period of 21 public hearings, we were able to convince the city council that we've made enough changes that they voted for it unanimously. Um, the mayor and council 6-0. But then there's still a group of people that surround the Cottonwood Mall, particularly those that are in the neighborhoods right next door, who have been challenging that decision and who have um, sponsored a petition that would lead to a referendum. On Monday, there was also a lawsuit filed by the same group um, challenging the city. And so even though we went through 21 public hearings and made enormous compromises, there are people who don't want the change. They, they, they will not accept it. And, um, and so one of the questions I have is, are we going to allow zoning by referendum to govern what happens going forward, or are we going to support elected officials, which gets to your point, will we let government rule, or will it be mob rule? And, you know, it's, what happens is, you know, with referendum as an example, they don't have to convince people of much. They're going door to door and just saying, hey, just sign this petition. You don't have to say you're in favor of this project or not. You can be in favor of it or opposed to it, um, but you ought to have the right to vote on it. And everyone thinks that sounds good, except for that it can cause delays that are so significant after a long drawn out approval process that the developer in this case could end up just saying, this won't work for us, we're going to lose the leases that we've negotiated. 
they have certain timetables. Some of the people we're working with that are major retailers are going to pick one location in the valley, and now that that may not be the location that we're working on, and other tenants is saying we have a three-year time horizon, and we're saying, well, it's going to take us six months to design, two years to build. We cannot have a year delay or a six-month delay or whatever else. And so, in effect, they can halt a project. And should that be the case, um, for us to get people, once they're educated, we've had dozens of people calling our offices and said, I didn't really understand what I signed. How can I get my name off? And what we say to them is, well, you have to have a, a statement notarized in order to get that taken off. So they can easily go door to door and allow people to just sign. And in fact, sometimes they're just putting the names of all their family members and whatever else that are residents. And these things do get looked at later by the county and the city. But it's a challenge because in the end, it's a very difficult process for a developer to, to get the word out. I mean, we've, we've done mailers, we've done 25 community gatherings um, outside of those public hearings. But it's very challenging. So I think the question that we're going to have to deal with maybe on a legislative level this year is how will our referendum laws be, you know, more fair and balanced so that we get good decisions that both give the public an opportunity to, you know, cry for something different, but at the same time support those that are governing. So anyway, that's a very long answer to the question that you asked. Um, Mary Street at Colliers International. I'm a commercial real estate broker, and I've worked over the uh, over the course of my career with a lot of uh, low-income housing developers, affordable housing developers, moderate-income housing developers. And in a recent conversation, and this is just some feedback for Representative Briscoe regarding um, the comment that you know the market will address this. So a recent conversation with a with an affordable housing developer. And he mentioned to me that while having communities on board and having zoning changes uh, to help make it more possible to build affordable, he said actually zoning just increases the price of the land. And so if you put the zoning in place to permit higher density, suddenly the landowners have a piece of land that's more valuable and the cost just gets passed right through into the development. So he suggested that, and I don't know if anyone from his company is here today, but he suggested that some conversations about how communities can participate uh, by providing carrots and sticks to, uh, to incent uh, or make possible more moderate and affordable housing and, and housing that's just affordable without being affordable housing, uh, that perhaps they could participate through a CDA model uh, where they give some incentives to developments that have mixes of product types. And so I think as we just in general, I think the market will be supportive of this and that the market, just market-driven development can contribute to it if we look at how our policies are implemented so that we're not just ratcheting up the cost of the land as we go through it. And a second thing is that I wanted to respond to the comment about uh, requiring a moderate income housing plan in our general plans and having them updated every five years. Those those plans need to have performance standards and they also need to have um, performance requirements. And if you're, yeah, they need to have teeth because uh, having, having been on a city council before in the city that I lived in, I can tell you that we did have a moderate to affordable housing plan in our general plan and it said, here's how many units we have and here's what we're doing. We're providing for a mix of density and that's it, that's our plan. Thank you for those comments, and I'll just address the last one, and that's really there was already something in statute, and it didn't have the teeth, and that's really why we work together on this um, HB 259, and there's you know maybe some room for advancement there too, but there is requirements now of certain different levels of, of and housing types in this plan and how they report um, and the teeth to you know get them to report and it can't just be a turn in the same report year after year after year. And so the league was great to work with us on that one. And, and they're going through a series of um, training to their, to their local um, 
communities that show them how to do that, when to, when to do that, what is required, and then how to report. So one question I have for, uh, for the private sector is, which markets are playing the biggest role and what are, what are causing the trends? So for instance, housing is a commodity, but it's also subject to global investment markets. And so what are causing some of these trends? We, we know that lot sizes are, are decreasing on average across the Wasatch Front, but we're also seeing square footage of homes increasing at the same time. So, so clear, clearly from a housing affordability uh, standpoint, that's, that's a trend that's going to cause an issue. Is that because of the investment markets? Is it because that's where the better margins are? What's causing those trends? Oh, sorry, Evan Curtis, State Planning Coordinator. I don't want to keep putting you on the spot, Clark. Is there anyone else here from the private sector? You know, actually, our, uh, we're designing uh, two very large series of new house plans this year, and they're all smaller. They're not larger. So we actually believe that there is greater demand for smaller homes moving forward. And while, you know, there's still a demand for larger homes and for meeting the needs of families, etc., we have a, uh, a growing 55 plus, you know, demographic. And, and then we also need to serve the younger buyer who's often single or just a, a couple. And, and in these cases, we're, we're designing much smaller plans. Um, I would say that the lion's share of our plants that we're designing right now are between 1,400 and 2,000 square feet. We are designing some larger homes for, you know, sort of the state areas, but most of the lots that we hope to develop in the future will be geared more to that size. Jeff Nelson, where are you? Great, is he still here? No, he left. Hi, I'm Linda Donaldson with Fresh Start Ventures. Um, we have a nonprofit. Uh, we help people uh, transition out of incarceration. And housing is a big issue that we are dealing with. We have 15 acres of land in Provo um, that we're trying to um, uh, get zoning on and, and change. And um, we also are working on sober work crews in the construction area and training as well. And we have quite a few people uh, available for that. But um, I, you know, earlier it was mentioned, you know, that wards are everything. I think we're a little. Con my concern is um, your advertising campaign, um, where you mention tiny houses and show pictures of people crammed. Um, so we're looking at a variety of options, and um, not tiny home on wheels. But I know the local uh, or recent 2018 IRC code allows for building under 500 square feet. Um, so uh, we also are looking at ADUs as an option. So um, uh, accessory dwelling units. So um, in on properties where there's you know in uh, ordinances that allow for that, where there's space. So anyway, I just wanted to mention that. Thank you for that comment. Does everyone know what the, the the apartment dwellings is, and it's how it is an issue here? Robert, do you want to speak to that? Is that what you're? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Go right. Yeah, for better or for worse, right? Yeah. For those who don't know, accessory dwelling units are using your house or a portion of your of your property to have an additional uh, dwelling unit there. It can be a mother-in-law apartment. It can be basement apartment, it can be a shed out back, it can, it can really be anything that maximizes your current house, your garage, a room over the garage, and there, there are many different ways it happens. And the good news is that most cities around the state actually do allow for accessory dwelling units to some degree. This is where, when I mentioned earlier about local government leaders being the most responsive, you, I, I saw Andrew Johnson here, like how, how many phone calls did you and your colleagues get on the Salt Lake City Council? I know I'm putting you on the spot, but when you guys were talking about ADUs? Not as many as for dog parks. <laughs> yeah, and if it, if it, yeah, if it rivaled dog parks. I mean, it's one of the most contentious issues. Yep, it is, because it, it, gets, it gets to that question of what is my neighborhood? Is my neighborhood filled with investment properties? 
or is my neighborhood a neighborhood of full-time residents who I know, whose kids go to school together, who go to church together, who see each other walking the dog every, every day? What is the neighborhood? This conversation is not new, and it comes up in the context of accessory dwelling units or mother-in-law apartments for people who live there full-time and for people who want to rent out a portion of their house to tourists who come in. And what we've seen throughout the country, what we've seen here in Utah, is, is that cities are trying to find that balance between those full-time residents who live in the community, whose kids are growing up in the community, and the balance of trying to maximize that existing housing stock for other people to live in the community or to stay in the community if they're there on a short-term basis. When I mentioned earlier about how true of low-income affordable housing is part of this overall conversation, one potential approach to that is maximizing existing housing stock with, with ADUs. But as Andrew, as Andrew mentioned, you get a lot of pushback from people saying, like, I have my property rights too. I bought into this neighborhood with a certain expectation, and now that expectation is changing. So again, trying to find that balance is, is part of why this initiative exists. And I agree with what you were saying about how, how words matter, and whether that, the word is density or tiny homes or other things, you've got to break down the barriers of the values of the people who live in that neighborhood to say, yes, your neighborhood is changing in the sense that it may not just be the family of five living in the house, maybe a family of five upstairs and then somebody living downstairs, but the values of the neighborhood haven't changed. It's just you have two families living in the house instead of one and trying to have that conversation because otherwise if you just say, we're going to turn over we're going to double the density of your neighborhood, and you frame it that way, forget about it. If you're saying we're going to turn, turn all these permanent full-time housing units and owner-occupied units into multifamily units, forget about it. But if you can frame it in such a way that people say, okay, this makes sense, or you know, this will help you know, my, my 64-year-old dad to rent out a portion of his house so he can stay in the neighborhood longer, now you're framing it in a different way that speaks to the values of Thank you. I'm Robert Grove from Envision Utah. Uh, just a couple quick comments. Uh, tiny housing is, an afford is a, a term of art in the, the affordable housing community, and it's one of the solutions that's being looked at for lots of people rebounding or get, getting back into housing and so on. So um, I know you, you didn't use the word in the ads themselves, but um, I thought we're, we're grateful in Envision Utah that this issue is getting all this attention. So thank you all for being concerned about it. I just want to raise uh, a message and concern that we've been watching for about 20 years. In our first value study here, uh, almost 20 years ago, we saw that about 85% of Utahns were in favor of Utah growing, and about 15% were not. So 85 to 15. That number in 2016 was at 42.37. So we are at a tipping point where if we aggressively frighten Utahns about what growth is doing to housing, we may shut down the housing. We may, may see a lot of people slam the doors on growth. We may uh, exacerbate a problem, not help it. And so there's a careful balancing about the messaging here. 42% of Utahns want it to grow. They see it as a place where they want their children and grandchildren. Uh, they see it as a place of greater opportunity for everybody. And those are the people we need to tap into, communicate to their values, but then also communicate to the 37% who are worried, frightened about their safety, about an apartment complex next door, and what it may do to their land values, their, their privacy, all of those people living close. Uh, there's, you can almost draw a values map as you move away from, from a more intense development coming near somebody. And, but we need to be careful in this overall messaging. Utahns like to be told there's a problem, but they like to see what's the solution. And I, I hope the campaign will focus on, we got a problem, but we know how to fix that problem. We're Utahns, we fix problems. Uh, the other thing that I think would be helpful in this campaign is I know developers, builders, communities are all working on this problem. We have a lot of great things happening. There are a number of things that can happen which will undo the work we're all doing. 
Um, I won't spend time on that, but we need to, you know, point at the things that are happening that are going right in Utah. And uh, you know, Cameron can give us stories of communities are working hard on this issue. I know developers are working hard on keeping costs down and trying to keep things affordable, hit and hit the right mix. We just need to make this a solution-oriented campaign as much as we can. I think people feel the crisis. They're feeling the pressure from traffic. They know growth is causing challenges. Let's ride that curve successfully with really good messaging. Great. Thank you, Robert. That's awesome feedback. Hi, I'm Jeannie Simmons, and I'm with the Logan City Council, and I also spent six years on the Logan City Planning Commission. Um, but and I am chair of the Cash Water District. So um, one thing I want us to remember in this conversation and keep as part of the conversation is not only do we have mountains and lakes, we have limited water. So we have to be careful in our development, I believe, to both maximize that resource and not just drain it, literally and figuratively. Um, because it, we can't live without it, obviously. Um, I think infrastructure and all of the pieces that cities become responsible for once the developer is done have to be part of the mix as well. There has to be some element of sustainability over the long term. We look at our, um, in Logan, you know, one of the popular terms is aging infrastructure. And it's incredibly difficult to assemble the resources to pay for that when what you have is increasing density, which is not all bad, but sometimes it taxes the resources that are already in the ground. And we don't have a way to be able to um, actively and proactively repair, replace, and upgrade those resources to accommodate additional growth. So I think that's gotta be part of the conversation as well. Thank you, those are great comments. Um, Robert Vernon, Provo City Housing and Utah Regional Housing. Um, just to kind of tie together um, what Robert and what Cameron said at the end of his talk, um, United Way in their five-year assessment in Utah County um, came out with a figure that 80% of the growth is internal. And so all of the people who don't want density, it's your own kids that you don't want living near you. I mean, that's, you know, and, and they're going to be living in your basement. Yeah, you can applaud. So. Yeah, and so that's in the marketing. I think that's one key thing to hit, and and maybe I mean radically you could frame that as if you don't want density, then we should start limiting families to one child per per family, and and see and, and see what that generates in people's minds. Thank you. Those are great comments. Yeah. A few of my comments got answered before me, but uh, I'm Ed Blake, I'm the CEO of Habitat for Humanity. And one of the issues uh, that I see is, comes from the old saying, why should I build water, it's not leaking on my side of the boat. And uh, that's one of the challenges that we have is, everyone is involved in this problem. And I think that the, what we do with the media and so on, we need to engage the person that's living in a $900,000 home. Um, I wrote an op-ed piece about this last month, with some solutions that did include ADUs. It did include a number of things. And if we use government money, quite frankly, in the area of affordability, um, the problem is is that we spend that money and then it's not affordable five years down the road. Different faces are in those homes. And they might be renting that home. It might be a landlord that owns those homes. And, excuse me, in Habitat, we've struggled lately with this idea of deed restriction. In other words, when we build a habitat home, let's leave it as an affordable home into perpetuity. And we've been wrestling with the idea of a deed restriction that requires that owner to sell it to someone making only 80% AMI or lower. 
this is a hard pill. It's a jagged pill for us because we're involved in uh, owning intergenerational poverty and things along those lines. But you know what we're seeing right now is Habitat homeowners that if in fact uh, the single mom gets married and moves out of our house and everything, sometimes they're walking with a quarter million dollars. And that corrupts our mission too, to some degree. And so we're looking at that. But I would like to see us using the money in a manner that uh, holds affordable housing into perpetuity. And so that we're not dealing with this problem in another 20 years or another 30 years. We're not going back to it. We have some housing stock that was held in affordability. Great, thank you. We've got a few hands still risen. Muriel Sochmill with X Factor Strategic Communications. Um, it's interesting to see how you know people um, say what they want through their elected officials, but they behave perhaps differently, and that's reflected in the market dynamics. And so there's an incongruency there between what we say we want and then what we do. And I think that there needs to be a better connection, um, you know, a message to the public about what that is, because right now I think people don't see, you know, necessarily what they, they say they want um, and then how they're, how they're acting. Um, I think one last point too I just want to make is um, technology is advancing at a rapid rate and that has implications for housing, transportation, and, uh, and that will be really important to keep in mind too. The sharing economy, connected autonomous vehicle technology, um, you know, what we're doing with areas in our region that will be repurposed um, when brick and mortar, um, you know, companies go away, um, you know, things like that. How are we, how are we looking at, and this isn't a gradual change, this is going to be much more accelerated um, in the future, so. Thanks, Muriel. Hello, Jonathan Hardy with the Department of Workforce Services. I, I hope everybody knows that there is a new, everybody's all excited about a new state commission, but there is a new state commission on housing affordability, aptly named, uh, I, and I, the chamber does have a seat on that. Uh, Representative Briscoe is one of the, the members on that. I think he knows that, right? The speaker told you you were appointed there. Okay, good. <clears throat> Uh, I'm also a member of one of the staff to the committee, and we're excited to get this, uh, this commission underway. We think it's a very large conversation. Obviously, everybody in this room cares about the issue, along with a lot of other stakeholder groups. Uh, one of the uh, objectives of that commission is to make uh, legislative recommendations uh, on you know, solutions. And uh, we've heard a lot of these things before. We're excited to you know, delve into them a little more. I think the important thing for this group to know is there, there's the possibility of forming a lot of subgroups and to get anything done of substance, I'm almost certain that we're gonna need uh, lots of you to peel off into little groups and tackle these types of issues on a more uh, granular level uh, so that you know that commission can kind of just respond to the recommendations rolled up to it. So I hope you'll take an active part on that. We, uh, we believe that the governor just finalized the appointments on this, so we should be having a meeting probably within the next month, uh, kind of a kickoff meeting, but we're, we're kind of under the gun already. I mean, legislative session uh, seems like a long ways away, but to get these things in motion and, and get some uh, legislation around, you know, large-scale policy issues, uh, we hope you'll participate fully in that and just know that we're, we'll help facilitate those conversations and, and be a partner in that. Hi, I'm Scott Reddy with Y2 Analytics. We are a public opinion firm here in town. And many of the front lines of these development battles, uh, we, we do a lot of municipal work. Many of the cities that are front lines are clients of ours. Um, they didn't hire us to do uh, density studies originally. We were hired to do citizen satisfaction. But every single study we do has turned into a housing density study. We did a study in South Georgia about a pool, turned into a density study. We did a study in Harriman about a, a, a hike, a hiking trail, turn it to a density study. Um, I think it's easy to minimize NIMBYism as being illogical. And I'll tell you, as a student of public opinion, you can say that about a lot of things in public opinion, okay? Public isn't required to be logical. And so as a result, it's, it's easy to minimize it. It's easy to think we'll just fight those feelings with facts. 
Um, it's been my experience that always hasn't been beneficial, especially because some of those facts fly in the face of core Utah values. And so um, I'm going to speak to one that hasn't come up. It's not an easy thing to talk about, but when Utahns think about apartments, uh, they think that that's going to bring in a type of people that they don't want to live next to. They're not thinking of their kids, right? And that's a core issue. That's something that our advertising is not speaking to. Um, when Utahns think about density and trains and buses that are, are a reality that flies in the face of uh, their, their entire life existence here, flies in the face of that truck they bought last month. And so um, I just want to speak to that because uh, it's easy to minimize it, and if we do, then the money that we spend on trying to re-educate the public is going to be misspent because it's going to be talking about things that they aren't really all that interested in. And, and from a NIMBY point of view, I think there are some of these projects that are very local, that are very NIMBY, a given development in a given spot with a given neighborhood. But when we're talking about the southwest side of the valley, it's the word NIMBY is not quite right because it's the entire sector, it's entire cities. There are elected officials whose entire platform was running on stopping development. There are mayors who, that, that was the entire platform and they got elected. So I think we need to be careful about minimizing the anger. I think it's real. Thank you for those comments, I appreciate that. Just as, just as a note to, the, to you guys all that the permits that had been let in, out of the last year, there was about 15,000 permits, um, no, 25,000 permits, and 15,000 of them were in multifamily. And I put up that slide and that I should have done that, but we're seeing more and more permits on, on the multifamily level than we are on single family homes. Yeah. Thanks. Back then, a 10 year trend, half of the building permits in the four county area are multifamily. And they're all getting built, and we're still at 2.5% vacancy rates. And that's a very powerful statistic. I just want to, uh, Andrew Gruber from Wasatch Front Regional Council, I just want to briefly pick up on the comments from Y2, which are so right on. And the, the dynamic at play <clears throat> politically, um, is not just at the local level, but it's a regional, broader regional question. And the Olympia development, which was discussed here a little bit, proposed huge outcry against it, and then vetoed. Um, tapped into a lot of these issues we're talking about, but it also tapped into a sense in the southwest part of Salt Lake County that the grow, rapidly growing areas are being asked to absorb all of the new growth and all of the density. Now, I don't think that's technically accurate, uh, but the perception in the fast growing areas is that is what they are being asked to do. So, to some extent, it is not accurate to say that in those fast growing areas that they are unwilling to accept a mix of uses. Riverton has the center cow development, which is a mix of uses, some multifamily housing contemplated uh, ultimately to be served by transit, but the perception in some of those areas is that they're being asked to take an unfair share. So think about these issues from a broader regional perspective. And I think that the general conversation that is happening around these issues tends to focus on the fast growing areas of undeveloped land, Utah County, Southwest Salt Lake County predominantly, when there is, there is so much growth coming that there is no way that it can all be absorbed in so-called greenfield areas. We have to be having a conversation, and Muriel mentioned this before, about turnover in brick and mortar, retail, infill, and redevelopment. And uh, Clark, I think he's gone, but he was talking before about, uh, about Holiday. Um, it's not easy, but there have, from a regional perspective, there has to be a balance of development in greenfield areas and infill and redevelopment in areas that are already built out and a lot of that, back to Cameron's point before, has to be taking advantage of opportunities for redevelopment around high capacity transportation. We have a rail system all around the Wasatch Front that is not fulfilling its capacity for moving people, and that has a lot to do with where people live. People say, oh, I don't wanna, I don't wanna take transit because it's gonna take me longer to get where I, where I need to go. Well, if you live in a house that is in a suburban area on a cul-de-sac, that's okay, but it's not a reasonable expectation that you are then going to be able to be served by UTA that it's gonna to come to your door and get you where you wanna go 
within the exact amount of time as driving. But if there's more opportunity for development, real estate and residential development to occur in a mix of uses proximate to a front runner station, a track station, then it's gonna make that kind of transportation much more feasible for people to use. And that's why coordinating the housing development with transportation is gonna be one of the key strategies to addressing these issues going forward. John Drew, Providence City Mayor of the Cache Valley. How many know where Providence is? Thank you. About half the room. I would like to know that Cameron was the first one to raise his hand. He was very <laughs> I know eager. Cameron, and he knows me. Uh, um, um, I could talk about this for two hours. Whether rubber meets the road, in my opinion, is the city councils. Uh, the biggest problem I have is educating our council members who are easily intimidated by a dozen NIMBYs that show up. And the, the YIMBYs that Wendy referred to are rare. And we call, I call them the silent majority. Seriously, and when I meet one, I pull out my card, I give it to them, I say, please come to a council meeting. Please, you know, state me. Tell, Tell the council, tell the public what you told me. I'd love to live in Providence, but I can't afford to. What's your what's your price range you can afford? Two hundred, two hundred twenty thousand. You know, what do you do? Well, I'm an engineer. Well, I'm a police officer. Well, I'm a fireman. I'm a school teacher. Those things. Um, they're not riffraff. They're not. Um, we have a discussion about rezoning part of our city, and no matter where it is. It's a different set of neighbors that show up, but it's all the same thing. Um, last year, it was design standards. Uh, we solved that problem. Guess what? Two weeks ago, it was traffic. Well, we did a traffic <coughs> survey. Guess what? The road where that's on is less than 20% utilized, far from even close to capacity. 24 townhome units is not going to make a difference. How did the council vote? Against it, fourth time for the same parcel of property. Um, I, I'd love to see some YIMBY show up, but for a lot of them, it's their neighbors or possible neighbors. Parents. Courage, courage to stand up and, and be heard. And we've had a few of them, and it's been very uh, encouraging. Uh, in today's Herald Journal, a local paper in Cache Valley, there's a big ad, Space Dynamics Lab is trying to hire 40 engineers with you know, different specialties. They can't hire them because these people can't find homes to live in. And, and I like to say this is not about affordable housing or affordability, it's about available housing. The realtors up at Cash Valley will tell you what's on the market today, uh, the only stuff that's on the market, not the, quite the only, but it's the stuff that's outrageously priced because there's people just throwing them on the market to see if they can get those, those big dollars. And it's just, I mean, there's parts of our city that. 12, 14 years ago were starter homes. They're twice the value right now, if you can even find it. And uh, that part of our city with 6,000 square foot lots has doubled in value over that period of time. But the demographic that bought those homes uh, has not seen a doubling in their income levels. But you talk to these people and I tell them, you can't afford to buy the house you live in right now. It doesn't matter. They don't want townhomes down the street from them. Uh, and we as a city have done things to tweak our ordinances, we've sat down with developers, but that's the biggest thing we encounter is, um, is, is dealing with the public. And I understand where they're coming from. And I bought my home two years ago and I put all this sweat equity into it. And I saw the cattle grazing on the hill and the green hill sites. I don't want to see that change. So, I mean, I, I've heard a lot of how, how uh, dealing with the public, but I think as far as credibility is concerned, when you have these people who are school teachers and engineers, who would love to live in our city but can't afford to. When they come and, and the public hear them, I think that'd be great. By the way, um, I've spoken to uh, mayors in our uh, in Cache Valley. Uh, I've talked to Logan City Mayor. We would love to have a public forum up in Cache Valley to talk about this issue and get the public involved. Because we can all sit around this room here, I call it shining each other's shoes. We, we can all buy into it. We all realize we have a problem that's different a little bit in each 
uh, locality, but um, that that you know, getting all the big news media from Salt Lake down here and ours up there, I guarantee I can get them all to show up. But we need to get the message to the public. Yeah. And we need to address their concerns, and there's legitimate concerns. And um, that would be really helpful. But getting the, the Yimbies to have the courage to step up. To speak up, And, and sure. be heard is really, really critical. Because who has more credibility? I mean, they're gonna accuse us of being in the developer's pockets. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, but when you talk about credibility, it's the people that want to write a check and want to live in our city sure. and love Providence. Thanks, Mayor. I yeah. appreciate those comments. We're happy to come up there, and, and, and you're certainly on our list to come to our... Sure, absolutely. A few more questions. Tara? Tara Rollins from the Utah Housing Coalition. Um, I kind of um, would hope that this group would look at how the universities are really affecting um, housing availability in our communities. Um, you know, we're increasing enrollment at our universities, but are they increase in housing? And so um, I think that would be a really good thing to look at, especially um, on the heels of Moab and the universe, I mean, um, a campus going in there, increasing, I think it's 5,000 people in the next five years and them not having a housing plan. So I think that we need to look at um, some of the culprits that are causing the problem and bring them in to be partners. Great. And I also want to bring up, um, nobody talked about wages, and I think um, we need to address the fact that our wages are not increasing as fast as our rents. And um, the Out of Reach report just came out last week, and just in Salt Lake County, it went up 86 cents. So you, in order to afford a two bedroom moderate um, apartment, it is um, 86 cents more an hour. 19, 1990. yeah. So, and statewide it went up 75 cents, and that's 17.77 an hour. Thank you. So I'm Dave Watkins with Rocky Mountain CRC. We finance affordable housing. And one thing I will say is that the market is not going to fix the crisis of affordable housing. I know that there's a couple issues on the table. One is the shortage of housing, and then also the uh, shortage of affordable housing. And, you know, I actually live in Holiday. And, you know, whether or not I sign the petition, I'm not going to mention. but. I will say a few things, that we do have density housing in Holiday, and right behind a new Harmons, we just opened up um, two bedroom condos, and one of them sells for $650,000. And I would love if somebody in this room could tell me how many restricted units are in Holiday. Yeah. I, oh, Tara knows, because I talked to her this morning about it. <laughs> There are two units that are restricted in Holiday. How many do you think were being put in on the new development? Zero. And that's a problem that we see is that as we go out also speaking to municipalities and mayors and cities, which is great to have density housing or whatever housing fits that area, um, we also need to look at the affordability of it and um, putting in place a deed and we do that, we've actually worked with West Valley where we had a property, we did an acquisition rehab. The first floor had high levels of radon. We came in, we financed the full property, mitigated the radon, and then put a deed restricted on the units so that they were in place for affordable only. And um, that's not LIHTC, low income housing tax credits, but it's a, a, way, a way to help affordable housing. Steve Erickson, Crossroads Urban Center, and I also represent the housing authorities through NARO. I just want to circle back to Representative Briscoe's original question about how do we address those who believe that the market will solve the problem. Uh, I think that it's important that we recognize the market's not an invisible hand. It's the decisions we all collectively make, day to day, and in policy. And when I hear 
endless times over 30 some years on the Hill, I believe in the free market. Well, there isn't such a thing. And we're all subsidized. We're all in this together. We need to work on this issue all together and recognize that um, we have to have a collective decision that we're the market and we're not the invisible hand. We have to be visible about how we go about it and we have to be collaborative in a way that really makes good sense and we message to the issues that we've heard brought up about the, the need for integrating our planning and to recognize the fears and the values that our citizens have. And, and the issue of sustainability has to be front and center in that process. So with, with that, I want to say thanks for convening this. So we'll see where it goes. Well, this has been a great discussion and certainly um, really changed the direction of where we were going to a certain extent on, on our marketing and appreciate that feedback. So thank you.